Tau is a toolkit for advanced optimization, which is developed at Oregon. It uh, lives on top of the PETC software infrastructure and has a great deal of commonality with the, with the usage and so forth. So once you're comfortable with PETC, adding optimization is relatively straightforward. And with our most recent release, we've uh, actually now incorporated Tau as part of the PETC distribution, and it's contained as uh, part of the PETC repository. So updating it and keeping it in sync with, uh, with PETC is very easy now, and we'll continue to support Tau and PETC more or less as one package, even though it's got its distinct functionality. So Tau uh, handles problems in optimization, continuous optimization largely, um, where, for example, you want to minimize a function f of a large number of variables subject to bound constraints or more general complementarity com constraints, where rather than just having constraints on the bounds, you have constraints on functions of, of the various variables. And included in that is support for PDE constraints and other types of constraints as well. Um, Tau has, again, fairly standard Newton methods, a variety of types that take into account the, uh, the constraints. In addition, has quasi-Newton methods, which are um, methods that approximate, in some sense, uh, parts of the Jacobian without requiring you to compute the full Jacobian. And conjugate gradient, nonlinear conjugate gradient, which requires really no Jacobian information. It also has a powerful suite of uh, derivative-free optimization techniques uh, developed by uh, Stefan Weil for problems where just calculating the derivatives is too expensive or the functions are so noisy, it's just not practical to actually compute those. Here's a, a summary of uh, some of the methods that are in Tau, uh, whether they uh, handle constraints and whether they require gradients and Hessians. So there's a variety of semi-smooth methods, active set method, the constrained Lagrangian interior point methods, Now I'm going to go over to the uh, PETC tutorial. So we'll begin the first uh, really tutorial style presentation today. Um, if you have particular questions that are quick, feel free to raise your hands and ask. If you have an involved question, please save it for, uh, for the end. So I'm going to talk about the history of PETC a little bit, then the basic constructs of PETC, which once you understand Everything else becomes much easier. And then I'm going to talk about a particular core components of PETC, the ODE integrators, the nonlinear solvers, linear solvers, and so forth. Uh, first of all, everything is available at the PETC website, downloads, documentation, everything. We have a couple of mailing lists. Uh, the first one is a public mailing list where when you ask questions, you embarrass yourself by having everybody read them. The, Second one is completely private. That only goes to the developers. So if you have sensitive questions or you just don't want to be seen asking a naive question, send it there. We respond to them equally as often. So uh, you can use either one. If it's something that you think is a general question that a lot of people would benefit from, then it's good to use Petsy users because that gets archived and people can go back later and search, say, oh, did I have a question like someone already had, and fill that in. Uh, PETC has been developed for a very long time. The current version is really started in 1995, and we've had a number of people join and leave our teams over the years. Though Lois is, is still on the team, she hasn't been doing so much active development in recent years. That's why her, she's marked there without the blue. Doesn't mean she's not involved in the process. She's still very deeply involved in the process. And we have a, a full repository, thanks to the wizardry of a of Jed and Satish, we have a full history of our repository going back to the very first commit in uh, 1994. So you can go back and actually look at the very first thing I ever put into Petsy, and you'll see that it's in the systems directory. Because one thing that we, in doing numerical algorithms, often forget is some of the low-level infrastructure is actually just as important as the numerical algorithms. So being able to debug one of the very first things I introduced was this option start in debugger, where Petsy would start up the MPI job, get it into a state where it's past the MPI initialization, and then display the debugger for you so you could actually start debugging. I put all those things in before I wrote a single line of numerical code. And memory checking, error handling, and all that stuff were designed before any numerics. Because if you 
forget to do that, you don't end up with a really robust package. So Petsy is um, portable. It's designed to work with a very large number of different machines. Can run on almost any kind of machine, any kind of operating system, um, almost any compiler. We have real versions, complex versions, single precision, double precision, and we have a quad precision that works with um, GCC and G Fortran, which is very useful if you're working with problems that are very ill conditioned. So when you have a problem with a condition number of 10 to the 12th, which we're starting to see more of now that people are doing really multi-physics calculations, you can trivially build and run everything with quad precision and see, ah, is it round off? Is it the precision that's hurting my problem because of my grade ill conditioning? And you don't have to think so much about rescaling to start in that mode. Um, everything is written in C, but it's almost fully accessible from Fortran. There's very few things that you can't do from Fortran. Almost everything is accessible from Python as well. We have a lot of Python users. We have an enormous number of Fortran users. We wrote a MATLAB interface, but almost nobody uses it, so we don't really support it. And it's an interesting observation. I'm not sure why, why that's the case, but people really wanted to use it from Python, but they don't really want to use it from MATLAB. It's open source. We run very large problems on it. Um, we who develop Petsy do almost all our work on laptops. Because when we write new code, we write them on the laptop, debug, optimize, test, and we only go to the big machines and we want to optimize for large scale to test that works on the large machines and so forth. And I recommend you do the same thing. It's simply insane to be writing lines of new code on Mira or any large expensive machine. It's just not reasonable thing to do. And that's why you have to always have a little bit of portability in your code so you can at least go between the laptop and the mirror because the sad fact is mirror is not a, not a system designed for development. It's not easy to develop there, nor should it necessarily be since you can develop on other machines. Um, the next thing is the, the philosophy of Petsy is that uh, everything has a plug-in architecture. That is, anything that a library, that a Petsy library writer can do, an end user should be able to do as well. So in Petsy, I can introduce, as a developer who knows it all, I can introduce a new matrix format that stores the matrices in some other format than standard compressed sparse grow or something, and make it look just like all the other formats. The end user should be able to do the same kind of thing. So that's what we mean by a plug-in architecture for both the matrices, the vectors, the preconditioners, everything, as much as possible. In addition, there's something that's very important is composability. With um, problems today, you're really not generally using a single solver. You instead have some coupled problem that you have to solve each of the pieces and put them together. And then each of the pieces may themselves be coupled problems. That again, you have to divide, it, divide down and solve on those pieces. So that means the various preconditioners, the time integrators, the nonlinear solvers should be composable. So if I hand off this very large coupled problem to the nonlinear solver, I should be able to, inside my nonlinear solver, build up the solution process by taking two or three other canned nonlinear solvers on the pieces and compose those together so you don't have to write a new Newton method for your Aspen. You don't have to write a new solver for each of the pieces. You just compose them together. And this is a very important part of what we do is, is, is this composition. And we'll, you'll see a little more of it in the, uh, in the presentation as we go along. In addition, for algebraic solvers, Different problems have very different requirements. There's no black box solver that'll work for all problems. So what this means is you want to be able to experiment as much as possible with different solvers, try different things, see what works well, see what doesn't work well. Always guided by the mathematics behind the problem, of course. You don't randomly try solvers. But you can't just mathematically say, ah, this solver is going to be best for this problem, therefore I'm just going to code to that. So that means that as much as possible, we want the code that you write to be able to be used with 
all the different solvers available. So you don't decide, well, I'm going to write my simulation and I'm going to use multigrid. Instead, you decide, I'm going to write my simulation. And then at runtime, as much as possible, you decide, okay, I'm going to try a geometric multigrid and see how it goes. I'm going to try an algebraic multigrid like Hyper and see how it goes. Or I'm going to try an additive Schwartz method. Not, you don't make those decisions when you're writing your simulation. You should be making those decisions at runtime. Which means that the API has to allow that to happen. So you shouldn't have to hardwire into your code, for example, that you're using multigrid as much as possible. Now it doesn't mean that you can magically not hardwire anything into your code, of course. We just try to squeeze that down as much as possible. So these slides will all be available online, so I'm not going to um, go through and talk through every single one of them. Error rate available. Error rate available. Great. So you can read them in detail and ignore me if you like. <laughs> so the next step is deciding whether you want to even use Petsy. Depending on what you're actually doing, you may want to use a package that lives above Petsy and only use Petsy indirectly. So if you're doing eigenvalue problems, I highly rec recommend you either use RPAC or you use SLEPC and let that manage the eigenvalue process for you. Don't code your eigenvalue solvers directly yourself in Petsy. If you're doing optimization, use Tau or the parts of Trilinos that manage optimization. If you're doing finite elements in a more or less traditional way, then use something like DL2, LibMesh, or Phoenix, or a variety of other packages that exist out there um, instead of coding all the finite elements yourself. If you're doing something very esoteric with your discretizations, you may in the end decide that you have to code that all yourself because one of the standard packages doesn't focus on what you do. But if you're doing anything reasonably standard, it makes more sense to use something, um, some other package. Same thing for finite volume methods. So here's an overview of uh, the organization of Petsy and where it lives in the, um, in the ecosystem for HPC. At the low level, we use MPI, MPIIO, BLAS, and LAPAC as our kernels. Above that, we have a profiling interface that everything else feeds into. So when you make runs, you can get detailed information about where it's spending its time. So you can go back later and say, OK, what can I optimize and so forth. Above that is code for managing vectors, which you can think of as arrays or you can think of as field variables. Uh, matrices, which you can think of as op linear operators on those vectors. Um, some code for grid management. Above that are the linear solvers, consisting of preconditioners and Krylock methods. Above that, nonlinear solvers. <coughs> and above that, ODE integrators. And the ODE integrators generally, for certain problems, will use the nonlinear solvers, which use the linear solvers, which use these objects down below. Now, in certain cases, you can use pieces that are not in Petsy. So, for example, many people, for very good reasons, use our nonlinear solvers, but the linear solver, they use the Hyper's Boomer AMG. It's a very good algebraic multigrid solver. And we have an interface that just fits in here, makes Boomer AMG look like a Petsy linear solver. So transparently, you just install Petsy with Hyper, you can use our nonlinear solvers, and boom, just use um, Hyper linear solvers. And in addition, for example, at the ODE level, it can't reach quite that high, but we have plugged in an interface to Sundias. So you can use the Petsy OD integrator interface and compile Petsy with sundials and then use their uh, various uh, integrators instead of Petsy's. Compare with Petsy's, decide for your problem which is more appropriate. Okay, so the objects which are the building blocks of Petsy I'm going to talk about next. This is a thing that's sometimes hard to talk about in a varied audience. If you're used to programming in uh, C++, you kind of look at what we do and say, oh, it's really naive, it's simple, what's, what's the big deal about it? If you're used to Fortran 77, then you got to scratch your head and think quite a bit. If you're used to uh, Fortran 2008, you may be comfortable with the ideas or you may not. But once you catch on to this part of it, I think everything else just follows pretty easily from the documentation. So in order to do, introduce our Petsy objects, we first have to say a little bit about MPI communicators. But the one thing I'm going to say is uh, MPI communicator to me 
is just a collection of resources you want to use for a particular data structure or a particular set of operations. It defines that set of resources, which is generally a subset of all the processes or possibly all of them. Now, the reason MPI communicators are so powerful is because you can partition up your resources by using different MPI communicators. If you want half the machine to work on some problem and the other half to work on a different problem, you just create the two MPI communicators and each can go off independently and work without getting in each other's way. So all the PETSI objects, when they're created, all the PETSI objects, when they're created, take as a constructor um, variable a communicator. Because when you create a PETSI object, you always want to declare what resources it's supposed to use. So in this example, we're creating a sparse matrix. Actually, we don't even indicate whether it's sparse or not. We're creating a, a matrix. We're setting a size to it. We're setting some options to it. And then we're destroying it. Um, but notice in the mat create here, it's taking a communicator. So that indicates where the object lives. And mat is what people sometimes call an opaque object. It's a pointer to something where you don't know the details of what's stored inside there. If we wrote this in C++, it would simply be a C++ class, abstract class. It's written in C, so we manage the details of that ourselves. In Fortran, mat is again an opaque object. It's actually an integer that we use to look up on the C side to get back the object. But from the point of view of the Fortran program, it's just this opaque object that can do stuff for you. The other thing you'll notice here is this call mat set from options. We very much want dynamic use of codes where you don't hardwire in all the options you're going to use. Like you don't hardwire in, oh, I want to use a GM res restart of 10 and hardwire into the code. And then you realize, oh, 10 is just not working. I need to go to 50. Let's recompile. We want as much as possible that all the configuration information be something that um, you can set at runtime. So every object that we define has a set from options call, in this case, mat set from options, that looks in what we call the, mat, the options database and looks if there's any, any options associated with that particular object and selects them and uses the set properties of that object. So you'll see a little more of this in the later, uh, in the later slides. Um, the mat set options prefix is a way of giving a unique name to an object so that two different objects won't get confused about options that are not supposed to be shared between them. So the basic Petsy object uses, which if you programmed in Java or C++ or any object-oriented language you're kind of used to is there's a creation for the object, and then at the end there's a destroy for the object. Then there's other standard things you can do to an object. Uh, the most important are set from options, setup, view, and you can also change the name that's used in the options database, and you can name objects, and you can change types of objects. So you can take an object that's a Krylov solver and change its type from using GM res to CG. You can either do that in the, uh, in the code with this, or you can change it with the set from options from the command line or from an options database. The view is an abstraction of printing, drawing, saving to file, and so forth. So with the same view, you can save something in binary format to disk with HDF5, or you can draw an X window picture of the sparse matrix, or you can print an ASCII representation of the matrix and so forth, all through the same interface by just passing in different viewers. So a little more on the options database. There's a variety of ways to put entries into the options database. You can read up on the details. So here's uh, an example of using the options database. Just running an example with various options like SNES monitor says monitor the nonlinear solver operation. Or you can do KSP, SNES, converged reason. Then when it's converged or not converged, it'll print to the screen why it's converged. Um, Mat view draw means that You'll view the matrix and you'll use what we call a draw viewer, which is just 
a representation in graphics of the sparse matrix. Um, you can also control solver options like PC type. So I'm controlling the preconditioner and saying, okay, use LU. Uh, and I want to use a particular mat ordering like natural. I don't know why you'd want to use natural, but with PC factor, mat ordering type. So you'll see these long string of options names, and there's an organization to the option names that exactly matches what you write in code. PC factor set mat ordering type. The option would become the same thing, only with underscores and no caps, and set. The word set is just dropped because it's kind of redundant, so you can type less. So if you know the uh, functional interface for something, you can pretty much always guess exactly what the options database option is, and similarly the other way around. So here's the output when we ran this with, the, with the, some of the options. It just monitors the uh, nonlinear residuals and shows why the linear system converged. It always converged in one because we used LU. And then there's a picture of the sparse matrix for that particular problem. Uh, the second output is when we ran with SNES view. So SNES view by default produces an ASCII version of the object, which gives the highlights of all the options that are set for it. So when, in this case, we ran our, 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 um, our type was a line search Newton method. And the line search type that we used was the fault is cubic. These are various options for the line search. The maximum iterations we have for SNES, which are to the default, are 50, tolerances, and so forth. Meanwhile, the linear solver object was GMRES with the restart and so forth. And each of these different types and classes independently knows how to print its own information. So if you add a new Krylov method or a new precondition or a new anything, at the same time you write a little viewer that can display an ASCII information about that one. So this information is not collected in any common database. It's completely extensible. It goes back to the plugin environment. You provide a new PC, you can get it to print. I guess the PC information isn't, isn't being printed here. You provide a new Krylov method, you can get it to print whatever is appropriate for that Krylov method, like this one produces the information about GMRES. Doesn't require someone writing the library to do that. So here's the PC information, a lot of detail. And this is important. Whenever you use a solver, it may actually be using a large combination of solvers with a variety of options. So you always, when you're first working with it, you always want to run with SNES view or KSP view so you know exactly what it's doing. You're not guessing and thinking, well, I thought I used a direct solver, but I'm not sure. Or I thought on the course grid I did this. You just run with the view options and it'll always tell you exactly what it's doing. Um, we'll skip that one. Okay, so the core PETC uh, components and algorithms. I like to start the presentation with uh, time integration because I always believe that when you're using a library, you should use as much functionality from that library as you can. So if you know you have ODEs that you need to integrate, it makes much more sense to use PETC or sundials directly than to say, well, I'm going to use Petsy's linear solvers and I'm going to write my own integrator. That's fine, you can write your own integrator, but there's been some very smart people, not me, working on ODE integrators over the years and doing very good implementations. It's hard to believe that, you know, you in the first day could do something as good. In the end, yeah, you may want to experiment with new methods and so forth, but even in that case, oftentimes you'll want to start by saying, okay, I'll take the integrators and sundials and I'm going to add additional features or make them better and stuff, as opposed to saying, well, I'm going to start from scratch. Because starting from scratch means you have to build the entire infrastructure yourself. So when we first started doing these presentations more than 20 years ago, we started down here. And then four hours later, we got up to here. But of course, everybody remembered what we talked about here. And by this part, they were just asleep. So they ended up mostly using the linear solvers and not taking advantage of this piece. So now I like to start at the top and work our way down. So if you're doing a time integration, really look seriously at using one of the standard ones we provide because they're extremely flexible. Even if you want to do your own unique thing, you can probably use them and work your way down. Now if you're only solving a linear problem because, God forbid, your advisor um, 
you know, just assigned you a linear problem, then sure, go ahead and just start here. Okay, so here's the um, general form for integration with Petsy. Forget the iMac business for a moment. Um, we support um, ODEs written in this general form, so they can be um, um, really algebraic differential equations where you have certain terms that do not involve the derivative, they're just algebraic constraints, and then others that involve the derivative. And we write it in this form here in order to have a standard interface where whether it's an algebraic differential equation or just a regular differential equation, whether it's a first order differential equation or some other more complicated differential equation, you always use more or less the same interfaces. So you can provide your f function, you can provide your i function, which corresponds to the g, and you can provide a Jacobian if you want to use uh, an implicit method. If you're using an explicit method, of course, you don't have to provide that. If you don't have an f function, then you don't have to provide the right-hand side. It just defaults to zero. If you don't have a complicated g, so for example, you just have uh, x dt, then you don't have to provide this, and it pops in that basic one. Um, and of course, if you don't have a Jacobian, you don't have to provide. Now, given this general framework, we can do methods that are uh, fully implicit, where the Jacobian is actually formed from both sides of this guy, or you can do methods that are fully explicit that don't use the Jacobian at all, and you can use what are called IMEC methods, which are uh, implicit explicit methods. So implicit explicit methods solve the right-hand side part, F, in an ex explicit style while they solve the uh, left-hand side in an implicit style. They're kind of like what people do in PDE world of um, time splitting kind of things. And we have a great deal, a number of, of different choices for these with, um, with some local error estimates and, uh, and adaptivity for, um, for error estimates. Here, here's a picture of the flow control when you write uh, um, a PETC code that uses the ODE integrators. The user's main program is up here. They provide the function evaluations for the two functions that were indicated on the previous slide, or just one of them. And they possibly provide Jacobian functions. And they do some initialization at the beginning. So what happens is the code starts up, the user initializes whatever they need, they create the time step object, which we'll get to in the next couple of slides, in this part. Then they call the time step time stepper to do the integration. Inside the time stepper doing the integration, if it's using an implicit method, it'll call the nonlinear solvers. The nonlinear solvers, of course, call the linear solvers and call the preconditioners and so forth. The nonlinear solver, of course, will need to use the function evaluations provided by the user and the Jacobian evaluations used by the users. Then after the integration is complete, of course, the user can do whatever post-processing they want to do on it. So you see this control of the code shifts down to Petsy, and then inside of that, it can shift back to the user, because the user is providing their function evaluation. Of course, in C++, you just provide um, a class where you implement some methods, and we call those methods. Um, it's not commonly done in Fortran. That's why we try to kind of emphasize it again. In addition, the user can also provide their own code to do monitoring of the integration or the nonlinear solvers, visualization as the process proceeds and so forth. So again, not indicated in the picture, there's points where the time stepper can pass control back to user code to do something like visualize a solution. And then it returns back up to Petsy, and then the control continues and then passes back to the user and so forth. And you can, of course, provide your own um, details in the time step. Like, for example, if you want to detect when a certain property happens inside your solution, like the solutions start to get above a certain value, you can provide a routine that we call for you at every step, passes back control to you, you decide what to do, and then you pass control back to the solver. So you shouldn't think of 
the time step is really being completely a black box where you have no control over. You, you have a lot of control, even though it looks like Petsy's in control at that time, because you can easily have something call yourself inside there. Okay, like I said before, there's a lot of methods, and you can look on the slides for that. So we have some examples uh, for these. And um, just go through a couple of the command line options so you see the form again. Again, the details of each command line option are not important here. I just want you to see the form for when you start looking through things yourself. So um, in this one, I guess it's, it's uh, set up by default to use the SSP um, time integrator. And the user is choosing to use a particular one here by calling using the option TSSSP type and then the name of it. Um, in this case, they're choosing to use um, this uh, rows W um, time integrator. So they do a TS type, R ROSW, and then there's a subtype associated with that, a variety of different ones which are related to the order and, and so forth of the integrator. And they're deciding they want to monitor the adaptivity as the time step increases and decreases, they want to see what's happening, and they want that printed to the screen, so they're using this option here. And like I said before, all of these options, you can also hardwire into the code, but you don't want to, because you don't want to have to recompile a code just to change one of those. Okay, now, the next level is the nonlinear solvers. So if you have a nonlinear problem that you want to, you want to solve that hopefully doesn't involve time integration, the standard workhorse versus, of course, Newton's method, I'm not going to... Uh, Talk about those. Um, again, it's similar to the time integration in that the user can provide a function evaluation that they want to find the zero of, and they can provide a Jacobian or approximate Jacobian that they want to use in Newton's method. And Petsy needs to, of course, evaluate this function as it runs Newton's method, and it calls the user's function. The final point here, which I didn't actually mention in the, um, in the time stepping part, which partially goes to your question, and we'll see more details later, is oftentimes the user function that they provide for any of these, for ODE integrators, for nonlinear solvers, involves a lot of application data that's not important to the solver. The solver doesn't manipulate directly. So all of these functions take as an additional argument um, an application state, which we call a context for that, which is just a pointer to whatever data the person wants there. So in C, oftentimes they'll construct a C struct where they put you know, their parameters that they, that they need in the function evaluation, maybe three parameters or there may be 300,000, it doesn't really matter. And they just pass that pointer in. Petsy never looks at that data. All it does is pass the pointer back to the user's code when, when they do the function evaluation. Now the reason we do this through this context and passing through the function is if you have a complicated code where you have multiple nonlinear solves of different types, for example nested or just separate ones that need to be done, each set has to have its own application context with its own data. So you don't want to store that in a global variable or anything like that. So rather than using a common block to access that information, you would pass it through in this context. And We've rigged it up so you, even in Fortran 77-ish land, you can actually pass context through. There's limitations, but um, you don't even have to use a common blocks in Fortran 77. And of course, in, in the later Fortrans, you can use a real uh, derived type to pass that information in. Um, so the particular signature for the nonlinear function is simply the input to the nonlinear function, the output, the pointer to the context of the user, they don't have to pass anything if they don't want to. And then the object itself, which normally people don't need inside the function evaluation. But once in a great while, it's useful to have in there. So it's available. Similar for the Jacobian. The Jacobian, when you provide a Jacobian and it has to be recomputed, the function that the user provides takes a, a SNES object, the nonlinear solver object, the input x, two matrices, and then the context. So ignore that mat structure, it's gone. You don't need it anymore. Um, two matrices, so why two matrices? Well, often 
in building preconditioners, you don't actually want to use the true linear operator that you're, follow, that you're uh, solving with to construct a preconditioner. You want to use an approximation to it, something that's a lot sparser, or you may be doing matrix-free with your true operator and then providing a sparse matrix that's an approximation to it for your, um, from which you want to build a preconditioner like uh, algebraic multigrid or, God forbid, I ILU or something like that. So we've always got built in these two matrices. Normally, if you're not thinking, you just start by having them be the same and don't get confused between them. First one is actually what defines the, non -li the linear system. The second one is what you want to use to construct a preconditioner. And often the second one will just be the same as the first. We have, uh, probably won't get to it in detail, so I'll mention it now. Um, often computing a Jacobian is difficult, so we have lots of code to help you build um, sparse Jacobians pretty efficiently using coloring. Coloring just means that you only need to do a small number of function evaluations in which you use to calculate all the columns of the Jacobian. And you never have to provide the Jacobian yourself. Of course, there are the limitations of using finite difference. Differencing to approximate derivatives doesn't always work. Does it use an external library to compute the best color? Yeah, so we have uh, several canned colors that we got from MinPack. Um, and then, like everything else, it's a uh, plug-in architecture, so you can register a new coloring algorithm and call that one instead of one of the ones we provide by default. And that could be even a coloring algorithm that's specific for your problem. So, for example, we have some example somewhere where we have um, a completely structured grid square, and we have a canned, a little code that actually gives you back the, the exact nested dissection ordering for that canned square. It's not applicable for, you know, a general matrix at all, but for that one problem, we register that canned nested dissection, and it returns exactly the geometric nested dissection. We also have uh, nested dissection. Well, actually, that's no good for coloring. But we have the same kind of orderings for coloring, orderings for reductions in, in fill for matrices, and um, there's another kind of ordering I've forgotten that we added recently. All of them are plug-in architectures. Okay, so on to the linear algebraic level, and when we start talking about the matrices and vectors, we'll get a little bit into the data structures that the application code sees. So in Petsy, a matrix is really a linear transformation. It's an abstract object. Doesn't necessarily have a representation, so we'll call something that's matrix-free, we'll call it a mat, even though it doesn't actually have a representation. Oftentimes, we'll form or assemble a matrix by actually um, computing entries in the matrix and storing them as a sparse matrix. So just distinguishing between these two things. So there's a lot of different kinds of matrices that are important to work with in, um, in our world, and we have many implementations of them, and in addition, because of the plug-in architecture, you can provide your own. So of course, standard sparse ones using compressed sparse row storage or block compressed sparse row storage. Um, the inverse of something, which of course you almost never form. Um, Jacobians calculated with finite differencing. A Fourier transforms, of course, calculated with uh, fast Fourier transforms. Um, low rank corrections where you don't store B, but you store A and then store whatever the correction terms are. Short complements where, again, you don't store S, but you store these pieces. Tensor products where you don't have to store very much, but you get, uh, you can apply them very efficiently. And the next slide indicates that the ones in red, generally, you, you never actually form, you just use. But to the codes, they look exactly the same. They're just a map. You say map multiply, or, or you can do solves with them and so forth. And so except for the first one, these generally don't have matrix entries, even though they're, we call them matrices. So. Okay, so when you have a matrix where you don't have the entries, the Krylov methods are fantastic for them because they're structured around 
finding a solution by only using matrix vector products. Our Krylov solvers are all based on this principle, calculating the action of the operator as, as inexpensively as possible. So GMRES is a particular case that was talked about before, so I'll just pass through that. This goes to more how, how we have communication between the PETC and the application in terms of data structures. So this is a special case that's a good way to introduce the more abstract case that we support. So I'm going to go through this first and hopefully have a couple minutes to go through uh, the more abstract case. Many problems you can solve on a structured grid. Structured grids have lots of great properties in that they're easy to refine. They're easy to set up communication patterns for. It's easy to do something like finite differencing on them and so forth. So Petsy has this concept of a DM, which is an interface between mesh information, discretization information, that is application information, and the algebraic solvers, both the nonlinear solvers, the linear solvers, and the ODE integrators. And so oftentimes, rather than the user manually creating all the linear algebra objects they need, they use a DM object to create it for them. So in this, what we call a distributed array, which is the simplest DM object called a um, DMDA, I'll get to that in a minute. The, um, DM object has several properties. It can give you back global vectors, what we call global vectors, which are parallel vectors that are going to be used to store field information or the right-hand side to a nonlinear system or the right-hand side and the solution to a linear system and so forth. Um, ways to refine themselves. Ways to communicate between a local representation and a global representation, which I'll show in the next slide, and ways to generate matrices ready for you to use. Not actually the entries in the matrix, but sparse matrix data structures ready for you to use. So the next slide shows what we mean by local representation and global representation. Etsy is mostly designed for PDEs associated with geometry of some sort or another, though it can be used in other things as well. So we have an example here of a structured grid and an unstructured grid being partitioned in parallel. And then nodes are assigned to processors. So in this case, these nodes are assigned to this process. Now, if these elements here are going to do a finite element calculation, in order for this process to do the finite element calculation here for a nonlinear finite elements, it needs to know the values for these guys, which are actually on other processes. So those are called ghost nodes or halo nodes. And in the structured grid case, they're a lot simpler, but it's the same concept in both cases. What we call a global vector are vectors where in each process we only store the owned values that are on that process. What we call a ghosted vector or a local vector includes these other values. So don't get confused and think local means just this part. Local actually means the whole thing. So think of it as ghosted vector. So when you're doing linear algebra, generally you use this representation. When you're doing discretization calculations, finite elements or finite differencing, so for example here with finite differencing, you're doing a differencing here, you need these values here, for example. You need the ghost values. So you need a local representation where you can do those calculations. Let's skip that stuff. So DM object, this is a lot of detail about the DM object, but basically it can create global vectors for your mesh, local vectors for your mesh. It can handle coordinates for the mesh in certain circumstances and so forth. And to do communication, you do DM global to local begin, DM global to local end. So you take a global representation and send the ghost points to the other processors. It's called a split phase operation in order that you can overlap communication and calculation. So if you have other work to do, you can call this. 
do the other work, and then call this. And at this point, you have the ghost values, and you can continue doing a calculation with the local part. There's a variety of stencils, which are optimized for, for communication. We don't have to worry about that in detail. I'm not even going to worry about this. In detail, I'll just show you this one example. For a 2D, basically what you do is you're saying, I'm doing a structured grid problem. What kind of boundary conditions do I have on the various sides? Do I have, for example, periodic boundary conditions? Or do I have no particular boundary conditions that I care about? Or sometimes people like to use mirror boundary conditions, so you can do um, Neumann boundary conditions with finite differences. Um, what type of stencil I'm using, the number of grid points in the various directions. Just by providing this information, Petsy will then partition up that nice, simple, structured grid and be able to provide you vectors and matrices exactly for that structured grid. So yeah. the number of halo uh, cells is dictated by the stencil width? Yep. Yep. OK. So when it's a structured grid, there's a natural correspondence between the a local numbering and the global numbering for those, um, uh, for the degrees of freedom. Because you're just taking a sub-block of your entire block and saying, I want to iterate over that sub-block. So for structured grids, we have code set up that allows you to just work with the global numbering on each process. So um, the user then only has to provide functions that work with the global numbering instead of working with the local numbering. And um, here's an example of that. So if we want to do a simple calculation like this, the nicest way to think about it is, OK, each process is just starting for its part, going as far as it can on its part in y and then in x. And then it's computing using the values of x, index using the global numbering, computing whatever discretization it's applying, and then putting it back in in the global numbering, rather than worrying about converting to local numbering. Um, we have a couple other DMs in PETC, DMplex for uh, unstructured meshes, and DM Moab for, um, I'm going to skip the profiling part, even though it's important, you can read on this later. Because I still haven't really talked that much about vectors, and I think it's uh, important that I talk about vectors and matrices. I can't talk about vectors. I absolutely cannot talk about vectors. Okay, so I'll ad lib the vectors. And, and this is actually a very important part and goes exactly to your question of the, there's data that's really intrinsic only to the application code itself, like Reynolds number and other crap like that, that the solver doesn't really need to see or worry about. But there's the actual solution, for example, and intermediate things that are calculated with the solution that are owned both by the application and by the user. Because the application wants to get in there and look at the solution and monkeying with the solution as you, in, as you time integrate, for example. But the ODE integrator has to go through that same data. And you don't want to be copying that back and forth between two different representations all the time. Because if you do that, you'll take a real performance hit, unless you don't copy it very often. So this is why the Petsy object VEC is an abstract object. So a VEC object we usually think of as just an array. But in fact, 
it's really an abstract array in which you can do certain operations, the usual vector space operations on it. The underlying representation is free to be one of the PETC defaults or to be something specific to you. And the underlying memory, again, is free to be memory that PETC allocated, which is the default, or memory that you allocated initially. So if you decide for some reason all your vectors, you want to allocate that memory for whatever reason, I don't know why you would, but you could, then all you have to do is, because of the plug-in architecture, is provide a small little wrapper for the vector object where you allocate the memory and you pass it down to Petsy and say, okay, create a vector using the memory that I'm giving you instead of allocating our own memory. So this is really pretty simple for field variables because field variables are things where, you know, like pressures, temperatures, velocities, whatever. They're something that it's pretty easy to share between the two sides of things. The thing that's hard to share is matrix entries because matrix entries are in some sparse representation. Does a user want to manage that sparse representation and somehow tell Petsy what it is? Should Petsy manage it? So the way we think about things is pretty much matrices are our business. While vectors and that representation is much more the application's business. Because matrices are in an artifact of wanting to solve something. They're not really intrinsic to the, the thing you're simulating. Unless you're thinking of matrices as, as arrays of data, which we're not thinking of. We're thinking of matrices as being linear operators that is some linearization of the real problem you're solving. So Petsy matrices are actually plug-in objects where you can provide your own representations. But I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time it's crazy to do that. You should just use what we provide or do something matrix-free and so forth. Um, vectors, on the other hand, are things that are shared by both sides. And it's very easy for either side to create, in, create them and manage their life lifetime or um, just default to having Petsy work with them. So in general, we think about the field variables as something that both the application and the, and the library can look at and manipulate. And we found that generally we don't have to really worry about copying that data back and forth or conversion of formats because usually the format that's most appropriate for good performance with linear algebra is actually the same format that's good for performance with, um, within the application side of things. That is, if you're doing some calculation on your, um, on your solution, your approximate solution and stuff, the format that makes sense for that is generally the same one that makes sense for the linear algebra calculations used on that data. And so I'll conclude by saying I went through, you know, maybe half these slides at the most, and all these slides cover maybe 30% of Petsy. So we could give a full day tutorial on Petsy, and we'd love to do that. But within an hour, I've tried to introduce the main concepts so that the documentation, the manual and stuff will be a bit clearer on how to do things. And I can take just one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, so do we implement the uh, uh, communication avoiding algorithm introduced by James? So what we've done, so in, in our experience, the thing that kills the Krylov methods on large number of processors is the all reduces. So we've implemented uh, pipeline GM res, pipeline CG, and a couple other ones that have a dramatic improvement when you're talking a large number of processors or on particular other machines. Certain parts of the communication avoiding algorithms are something that could be implemented almost completely without changing the user interface. And in the future, we hope to be able to do that more to get, to get better performance. But we actually don't see, at least I haven't seen, that it's going to change the user experience very much if you say, okay, I'm going to use a GM res where we actually do 10 steps of the GM res with the single set of communications. From the user experience point of view, we don't see really much of anything in the way of changes in the same way that the pipeline GM res didn't change the user API at all. You could just choose to use that user API.
So that's one really nice thing. In certain circumstances, it doesn't dramatically change how you have to write your code.